Good morning, uh, Deputy Chief Justice Meyer. How are you? Well, under the circumstances, I'm okay. <laughs> Just relax, you will be fine. Okay. We don't bite. Thank you. <laughs> Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Where were you born? Who, who is Judge Zondi? Just very briefly. Well, I was born in 1957 in Peter and uh, attended uh, school. Uh, my high school education at uh, Dundee, um, Center Carson High School, which is in Dundee, and then thereafter I went to the of Fort Hare. And then from you know, Forte, I went to University of Natal. In, at Forte, I did the PUREs. And um, then I proceeded to the University of Natal in Peter Morris, where I did. Uh, would would like, you mind just bringing your mic closer okay, to you? Okay, thank you. That's better. Um, having completed my junior degree at Forte, then I proceeded to the University of Natal in Peter Morris, where I can, uh, completed my, and, and did my LLB. I, Thereafter, I did my articles. Uh, after admission, then I got a scholarship to study at uh, Georgetown University, um, where I did uh, LLM. And um, after finishing my LLM, I was given an opportunity to do internship in various firms in the US as well as in the um, auto uh, union, which is in Detroit, uh, dealing with uh, liberally tech matters. And, and thereafter, then, I came back to South Africa and um, opened my own practice and proceeded in various uh, fields. Other than that, I also uh, was given an opportunity to spent about six months in the U.S. Uh, teaching at the uh, Portland State University. And, but when my work got a little bit busy, then I was unable to proceed. I, I stopped in 1995. Mm -hmm. I did teaching uh, uh, in, 19, uh, in 1988 and 1995. And then I was at, well, I joined the bench. Well, I started acting at Cape Town um, High Court in 2004 and uh, until my appointment in 2007. Uh, in 2003, 13, I was invited by the former president of the High Court, uh, Justice Mpati, to come and act. Um, before that, I was also a judge at the Competition Appeal Court, as well as an acting judge at the Labor Appeal Court. So that's basically what I've been doing for the past 50, uh, 20 years or so. Yes. Well, you are being very modest. You, wh where did you say you were born? Where? Peter Marisberg. Peter Marisberg. Yes. You were not just awarded a scholarship to go and do your <coughs> master's in the U.S. You were awarded the prestigious Fulbright yes. scholarship. You're a Fulbright scholar. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in, in future, when you mention that, people must know that it was not just any scholarship. Yeah. Your experience uh, in the judicial field is wide and varied. You <coughs> acted at the Labour Appeal Court a number of times, and you were notably you were with the Competition Appeal Court yes. for a number of years. It's just. Tell us a little bit about the, the, the competition appeal court. How long were you there? Uh, bef I was appointed in 20, is it 2011. 
and um, my appointment was for you 10. You started acting in 2009. Well, I started acting, yes. Mm. I started uh, acting uh, before then. Um, and then when Justice Davis felt that I was ready enough, then he said I must make myself available and he supported me. Um, while I was at the competition appeal court, I wrote uh, various judgment, some of the judgment are co-authored with uh, Dennis David, like uh, SAA and Nationwide case, as well as the Walmart case, um, when Walmart uh, took over um, the, the, the South African uh, company, uh, a merger. So, uh, we were involved in, in the merger of, of, of Walmart. Mm. Mm. And you were there on a permanent basis? I was there on a permanent for basis. For 10 years? For 10 years, that's correct. Yeah. And then you, you, you decided? Well, the idea, OK, let me just go a, a little bit step uh, back. What, what used to happen was that the competition appeal court was not a final court our decision could be appealed against to the SCA until 20, was it 2013 when the legislation was introduced. Now it became the, as far as the competition matters are concerned, it became the final court. The idea was that I would continue to do cases at the competition uh, appeal court while I was serving at the SCA. Um, because the way we, do, we did things there was that we would do our appeal uh, competition cases like in January, and then the second batch will be done in July. So uh, during the January period, the SCA will be in recess and in July, again, the SA will be in recess, and then I will be available to do cases. But for some other reason, uh, that idea was not pursued. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm just trying to understand something. You continued your service at the CAC whilst you were an SA judge. No, no, no. I, I, I didn't, but that was the idea. Well, my appointment there was uh, for 10 years um, at the competition appeal. But when I moved to SCA, I, I, I did not uh, oh, do right. any competition uh, um, appeal court cases. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm particularly interested uh, in your involvement with that court and uh, the, the fact that you established, you know, a significant tenure there. Because yesterday, we, as you would know, we recommended the appointment of one of the most eminent uh, competition lawyers uh, yes. in, in the world, I'd like to think, yes, yes. who no doubt will carry out the, 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 his mandate mm -hmm. with, with, without any difficulty. But it still remained a matter of concern that he was the sole candidate, and yet we have people like you. I, I know there are other senior colleagues both in the Constitutional Court and the SCA, mm -hmm. who have you know, long experience in, in, in that court and uh, could have uh, maybe made themselves available for leadership there. Uh, wh why, I, I know that at, at least one, uh, the, the, the eye was, was on them to, to, to take over when J J just uh, J.P. Davis retired but then they went to the SCA. Mm -hmm. do, do you, can you perhaps, uh, from your own experience, shed light why the, the, the lure to the SCA is that the pool is, 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 is so strong that people are, are just, it's easy for them to easily walk away from that court that I think does tremendously well, important and exciting work? Talking for myself, um, the, 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 the idea was that I wouldn't be lost to the competition appeal court while I was at the SCA. What would have happened, what I'd expected to have happened was that the president of the court, Dennis Davis, uh, Judge Davis, 
uh, would have communicated with the president of the SEA and sort of coordinate the program of that court so that once he had uh, set up the program of that court, he would say, well, president of the SEA, this is my program. I will need Judge Zondi on this, on this day. But unfortunately, for some other reason, uh, the planning uh, wasn't as, well, it didn't happen the way I had expected it to have happened. Mm. So, so as a result, then I sort of, I... So you still had an appetite got lost to, to the, uh, continue to the in court. the court? Sorry? You still had an appetite to... Yes, to yes, I would have continued because that's, uh, that's what I had indicated to uh, uh, Judge Davis to say, well, and that's what he had uh, suggested, that um, if I go there, because now this court, the Competition Appeal Court is a final court, uh, there will be no conflict, you can do our cases, and because our cases are not going to go to the SCA. So that, that, that was my understanding at that stage when the legislation was amended. All right. And you have been at the SCA since uh, 2013? Yes, 2013. And, yeah. um, You've been presiding there for a good while now. And how, yes, have, you, how yes. have you found that, <laughs> that, that experience? Uh, first of all, I must just thank you and uh, Acting President Petzer, because you persuaded me to make myself available, and uh, at that stage I was happy doing my high court work and doing my competition appeal court uh, work. So, and then you said, "Please, just don't go away. Make yourself available." And uh, reluctantly, I uh, agreed, and that's why I am today. <laughs> so, yeah. You you are currently acting at, as as. In, in, the, in the position for which you are interviewing you, not so? That is correct, yeah. How, how long have you been there? Um, Justice Mba retired in, in July. Uh, according to the minister's uh, appointment letter, is it uh, August or? Yeah, all right. August uh, this year. Mm -hmm. in, in, in that time, have you been able just to sink your teeth into things and you know, assess where the court stands, what challenges, if any, there would be? And, uh, uh, yes, I have had a uh, sort of uh, discussion with uh, Justice Mba when he did the handover and to see where the court is and where the future of the court should be as well as the compos composition of that court. So I had that discussion with uh, can you, tell us, can you tell us about that and what your plan is? Okay, first of all, as it is now the, well, let me just start with the composition of, of this court. Uh, it's composed of the chairperson who is the judge of the SCA and two judges uh, from the high court. So we have got, at this stage, uh, we have got uh, Justice, uh, Mudiba, who is serving at the High Court. And then we've got two non-judge members, uh, which is uh, Professor Tama uh, Makanya and Professor Puku. So it's composed in terms of Section 19 of the Electoral Commission Act, it's composed of five members. Um, so at the stage we've so, got- Sorry, Justice uh, Shongwe. So the, the, uh, the, the as things stand now, there are two African there are two, females. There are two females, it's Justice Modiba and Professor Ntlama Makanya. Mm -hmm. And Justice Shongwe, who was the, the chairperson of that court, is acting. Mm -hmm. And now I, that position has been advertised and yes. Judge uh, uh, Musebo is, is going to, uh, well, has applied for that position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he is, yeah. yeah. So now, should she be appointed, then we are going to have three females. Mm. All right. And um, so it will be uh, Justice Modiba, Ntlama Makanya, and uh, Justice uh, Mamusa. 
-hmm. Right. All right, continue. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. Okay. So, now, since the judgment of the new nation, the Concord judgment, which now allow the independent uh, to campaign for uh, provincial and national, so that court is going to be quite busy. So what we're thinking is that we need to amend it, section 19 so as to increase the size of that court, at least uh, to have uh, 10 members so that we can have two panel sitting simultaneously. Um, because at this stage we've got only one panel, a panel of five, of, of three judges plus two uh, non-judge members. So if, if we amend uh, section 19, that will give us uh, about 10 panels, uh, 10, 10 members, and then we will be able to have a, uh, a, a two panels consisting of uh, five members. Mm. And that will be able to deal effectively with uh, the amount of work uh, which we expect will, will come in 2024. And um, the other thing that I've identified is that uh, in terms of section 174, the racial composition, it's, uh, it's still uh, to be a problem. We do not have uh, a white uh, or uh, uh, colored or, or, or Indian member in that court. I think that, uh, that that's, that's where we should look at now, mm -hmm. just to make sure that uh, we, in terms of 174, it's, there is a, a representation. So uh, once we've got, once we have, once we are able to amend section 19, then that will give us uh, that space uh, which we can use to make sure that the court is well represented in terms of gender, race, and yeah. Yes, is that all? Yeah, yeah, that's it. All right. Um, thank you, Justice Wendy. I'll, I'll, I'll leave things here for now and hand over to my colleagues to interrogate you if there's questions for you. Any questions, colleagues? <coughs> yes, uh, Commissioner Dodo. Yeah, carry on. I'll start, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy C uh, CJ. Good morning, Justice Zandi. Morning, Commissioner. Thank you very much. I, I want to traverse with you your, what is called now a landmark judgment on the AFRI business case against the Minister of, of Finance. Mm -hmm. That case, as we now know, pertains to the invalidity of the preferential procurement policy of, of government that was promulgated uh, in 2017. Now my question is to you, are you aware of the implications of your, of your judgment in relation to stalling the whole process of supply chain and procurement mm -hmm. within government? Are you aware of that? Yes, yes, I do. Because it had profound implications for government. Now my question is, can you make a suspensive or can you suspend the implementation of the regulations in relation to the judgment itself? Because that judgment suspended actually basically nullified the regulations. Well, and it halted the whole process of procurement within government. Uh, let me just, I just want to have a look if uh, that judgment uh, to say what order we made, because uh, I, I don't want to, 
just say, just want to speak with reference to, to Oh, yeah, that's it. <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. Okay. The problem was with the regulations because the regulation provided for a pre-qualification criteria. Now, that pre-qualification criteria was based on race, which is something that is already taken care of under that, whether it's 90-10 or 80-20, depending on the size of, uh, of the contract. So if you have got a pre-qualification based on race, then it means already you are going to exclude people who do not belong to that particular race, which is, which is not what uh, the, the Framework Act says. You know, it must be, the process must be transparent, competitive, and cost effective. So already once you have got a situation where we have got a pre Qualification, which is based on, on race, then other people are going to be excluded. And when then you assess pricing in order to make sure that the bid is competitive. And secondly, we, we, we said, okay, that's fine. The regulations are invalid, but we give uh, them 12, uh, 12 months with these to sort of uh, come up with uh, proper regulations. So, in the meantime, they could still use those regulations, but we, we suspended the order of uh, uh, invalidity, uh, declaration of invalidity for 12 months. Actually, that is my point, because yes. the department itself had to obtain uh, clarity from the Concord in respect of that, because in my respective view, I saw this as mm paralyzing oh, yes, the whole procurement yes. system mm. without give, suspending the regulation to be implemented after, after some time, and that clarity, that clarity was not there. Yeah, uh, paragraph two of the order, uh, paragraph 47, uh, 2C, the declaration of invalidity referred to in paragraph B above is suspended for a period of 12 months from the date of this order. So that's what we did in terms of section 170, uh, is it 72 or 1B? Otherwise, it, that was a, yes. a, a good judgment, yes. an intervention to mm. straightening up uh, Section 217 so, of no, the no, Constitution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did not want to paralyze the process. We said, okay, that's fine. There is a problem with the regulation as they, as they stand. But uh, I'm sure it was because of oversight on, on the part of the people who came up with the regulation. Let's suspend the declaration of invalidity to give them time to sort of come up with uh, regulations which will be consistent with the Framework Act. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DCJ. Commissioner Klaber? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 DCJ, and uh, good morning, uh, Judge. Morning, morning, so, Commissioner Thank you so much. Morning. Um, <clears throat> let me ask the question because uh, I, 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 I have already posed it to the colleague who came before you, <coughs> to the judge uh, who came before you. Um, <coughs> the electoral code of conduct, um, the law it says uh, it, it, it becomes operational from the time uh, the date of election uh, is, is gazetted. Um, to the date the results of the elections uh, is, is declared. Um, <clears throat> so it's usually a period of about two months because mm -hmm. uh, the date of an election will be gazetted two or three months before 
before election. Uh, <clears throat> but the practice on the ground is that the campaign uh, starts long before that and uh, parties uh, put up uh, their uh, election uh, material and <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of breaches that would be deemed to be breaches in terms of the electoral code but for the fact that they happen outside the, the, the period, they are not regulated by the electoral uh, code. Um, in, in, in view of that, um, <clears throat> what is your, your comment? Um, uh, have you seen more uh, alleged uh, cases happening before the, this window period, but that which you can do nothing about? Uh, if yes, it, will it be wise perhaps to extend the, the, this window period mm -hmm. um, so as to accommodate uh, the period when, uh, which is much earlier than the period that is um, gazetted, this window period uh, in, in, in the law. What, what is your comment on that? Well, um, first of all, I, I, I haven't, those cases haven't come to electoral court. But if they do come, I think that because I mean the the, the IEC would, would not have jurisdiction to deal with those co with, the, with those cases with those disputes dispute because they would fall outside the, the time period. But I think that the electoral court will will have a jurisdiction to deal with them, and um, because I mean the, the powers of the electoral court are much wider than the powers of the of the IEC. Maybe just a, a quick follow up uh, to this. In, in your um, opening remarks, you advocate, you said uh, you would advocate an expanded uh, court, uh, moving from at least the current five to about 10, so that you can have uh, two streams uh, 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 sitting to attend to, to the matters instead of one. Would you, would you, if there's a view mm. that, that says instead of having more cases coming before the electoral court, strengthen the con conciliation uh, mechanism at an IEC level and, uh, and all other systems so that uh, 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 matters are dealt with there mm. uh, so as to um, discourage a, a situation where the court will be inundated uh, with a, a deluge, the number of cases as has been mentioned before. W would you uh, support strengthening the mechanisms at an IEC level or uh, expanding expanding the court. If it's if if it is the, the latter, why uh, so? Okay. All right. Your first approach, which says in terms of which the IC must strengthen to deal with conciliation, and there might be some problem with the first approach in the sense that what happens if? the dispute are not resolved at conciliation level because now once that step, that first step of the process fails, then you need to go to the adjudication stage. And now the adjudication stage is a stage that falls outside the ambit of the IC. So the only way maybe you can deal with the kind of situation is to amend the legislation 
to give the IEC both the powers to conciliate and to arbitrate like CCMA does, I, I don't know. Conciliate and if the conciliation fails, go to the arbitration or adjudication as the case may be. But that mechanism will need to have the act to be restructured in such a way that those powers are conferred on the IEC. Because as it is now, if you look at section 20 of the Electoral Commission Act, which deals with the powers and, and functions of the, of, of, of the Electoral Court, it, it's, it's clear that those, these are the functions and the powers which the IEC cannot do. So you need to do a complete overhaul of the legislation if you were to go to that road. But I, I, I accept, I will, I, I, I say it, it's, 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 it's possible, nothing is impossible as long as there is a planning for it and you put in place the mechanism to implement that planning. It's, yeah. Thank you, uh, Judge Wendy. Commissioner Nyambi. Thank you, DCJ. M morning, Judge Zondi. Morning, Commissioner Nyambi. I'm happy that uh, the gender composition of uh, that court is fine and already we have reflected about the challenge of the racial composition and uh, the issue of the amendment of section 19. Besides those challenges, knowing very well that come 2024 we'll be having independent candidates uh, in our elections in South Africa. What are the immediate challenges that you think need some serious attention in that court? Well, a, well, to prepare for 2024 when we are going to have um, independent candidates, the first prize would be amend the legislation to increase the size of, the, of that court. Or maybe, uh, Okay, increase the size, do away with non judge members, and appoint judges, permanent judges, because the electoral court has got, has got the same status as the high court. Okay, so the high court is being served by high court by judges, and if there is a need, like in the tax matters, you get specialists like uh, uh, accountants or business practitioner to assist the court when it deals with income tax matters. That, that's, that's, that's another option that can be explored. But at this, at this stage, without increasing the size of this court, I don't see how this court would be able to function effectively because remember, electoral dispute are by nature urgent and they have to, to be dealt with expeditiously. So if you do not have the correct size of the court to deal with the dispute, then that court will be failing in its mandate to deal with the electoral dispute expeditiously. Maybe what can be done in the interim, assuming that it will take much longer to get the legislation amended, is to say, okay, let's, let's, get, let's get a situation which will allow uh, the acting judges to be seconded to that, to that court. If, if it's going to take much longer to deal with the, with the, with the amendment before 2024. Just but something must be done to increase the size of the court, either by way of uh, Get, uh, allowing that, uh, allowing a situation where acting judges will be allowed or seconded to that court. Just or judges from my court will be seconded to act as acting judges in that court. Sorry, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. Quick follow-up on the same yes. subject here. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, judge. <clears throat> yes. I hear this thing of independent candidates. 
apart from the court ruling of those independent candidates, is there any legislation that says there's going to be independent candidates in 2024? I don't know, because there, there is no legislation at this stage. Um, and um, I don't know how far, well, I don't know what's, what's going to happen, because now, according to the High Court in this uh, um, new nation matter, there must be legislation. Uh, because, I mean, the electoral uh, act as it stands is unconstitutional, so it doesn't create a space for independent uh, candidates. So even if you go ahead in 2024 and hold election, those, those independent candidates will, like in an Anthropic case, they'll be able to challenge the result of their hang on. Hang on. It, in terms of uh, the High Court, uh, the Concord judgment, you are supposed to have amended the legislation so as to include us. We are not included, so we are still being uh, marginalized. So whatever we'll be doing in 24 without getting a legislation in place will be an exercise in futility because they can go back to the Concord and say the parliament hasn't done what you asked it to do in 20, 2020, 2021. So that's, <laughs> that's a problem that we'll be facing. Okay, I'll wait for my turn. No, uh, we are correct, Judge, we are with the matter as, as Parliament, we are dealing with it. My second question, uh, how can you rate the performance of the Electoral uh, Court in fulfilling its mandate in the past few years? Well, so far, looking at the statistics which uh, Judge Mbar had when we had a meeting with the Minister and the uh, and the uh, CJ, uh, it, it's clear that it has been doing well in terms of the law, in terms of the act, it has got to deal with the dispute expeditiously, it has got to deal with the appeals uh, uh, as soon as, uh, finalize the appeals, reviews as soon as possible. It has been able to uh, perform its mandate. Thank you, Judge Zondi. Thank you, DCJ. No, thanks. I, I want to converse this matter with you, uh, Please. Judge. When we, there was a debate to postpone the elections, now, recent local government elections, yes. the, the, the court's emphasis was that when the election period comes, mm. you have to hold elections. It, it is more important, not more important, but was the biggest argument was whether they are going to be free and fair under the conditions of COVID-19. Yes. And the court said, when that period comes, mm. you have to hold the elections. And we did hold the elections. Yeah. So when that period comes, where elections must be held, and there is a constitutional court decision that there must be independent candidate and the legislature is unable to meet that mandate, but the period is here and elections must be held. What happens under the, such circumstances? Okay. I assume those who, who feel that whatever process that will be embarked upon will affect them negatively, they will have to bring an application in good time before whatever, before the 2014, before the 2024 and say, this is what the Constitutional Court said, this hasn't been done. So, direct Parliament to do what you asked it to do two years ago. Okay, that's, that's, that's number one. Um, the, the option of, uh, of postponing the election doesn't exist. It's because of the nature of the legislation. You see, Section 159 is clear. It says, well, I'm talking now with reference to municipal council or it's five years. After five years, you need to have election within 90 days. So if five years has come, we've got 90 days within which, unless of course, if parliament amend 
this, hundred, this 90 days and say, okay, we have got five years and 180 days within which to hold the election. That will be okay. That will give parliament uh, sufficient time to do it. But will it be able to get the constitution amended well before the 2024? Because you need to amend the section that imposes the 90-day period. Because once the 90-day period has come and gone, that's, there, there's nothing that you can do. Like in, 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 Mshop, in Mshop case, there were serious irregularity. But because of this 90-day period, you, and there's no provision in the Constitution which either gives the court the power to postpone, you are stuck. So the, 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 the problem is with the constitutional provision. If you feel that you are stuck and it's unable to get your things done, amend it maybe to sort of uh, increase the, the period so as to enable you to get your house in order. So with the constitutional court decision that you must have independence, and in the absence of such amendments as we speak now, and five years comes and 90 days, and legislation is still the same as it is now, it will be wrong to assume, sitting here, that there's going to be independent candidates. Because even that... But, oh, sorry, so go ahead, go ahead. Even, go ahead. even that alone, it is not only about independent candidates. It's, there's also a question whether you should have constituency-based um, um, uh, uh, candidates or individual candidates who register on their own, and such consultations are still going on. You've got the IEC that needs a maximum two years to prepare for elections. That's what they say in terms of their timetable. All of that, if you look at it, it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to sit here and assume there's going to be independent candidate and be asking questions based on non-existing legislation, for me, is neither here nor there. Well, but a space has been created for them to operate within the electoral environment. So all that you need to do is to facilitate that space for them to, by passing a legislation, they will be quite entitled to go back to court and say, this is what we obtained. A space hasn't been created. Well, you created a space for us, but there is no legislation that has been enacted to facilitate that space for us. So uh, you'll be sitting with the program, to be, to be honest with you. Unless, of course, if you, because that would be tantamount to ignoring the court orders, you see. That's, 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 that's no, we are not, be... Judge. We are busy with the court order. <laughs> that's going to be a problem. But remember, uh, on a lighter note, I come from a political party, so I'm not for independence. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you're getting to, because <laughs> I know. <laughs> but a uh, space has been created for, uh, um, for them by the Corn Court and uh, the rules of an engagement must be put in place to enable them to exploit that space. That's all that I wanted to say. Thank you, DCJ. Thank you very much, Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, good morning, Judge. I'm here. Okay. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your in your vision, and I'm, I'm 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 thinking that should you be appointed, this is something that you may want to pursue um, with the relevant authorities, that of increasing the members of the of the of the court for efficiency purposes, as you have stated. Um, I look at section 19 of the, the the act that establishes the court, the electoral court, and of course it it is clear that you need five members. Um, and it just deals with the, with the, with the court itself, not necessarily the, the panel and the, the composition. Um, and when one looks at the, the rules of the court, I'm not sure if I have the most recent ones, mm. 
uh, Rule 3 of the court actually deals with the actual composition, mm -hmm. that all members should be uh, sitting on the um, hearing a matter unless one of them is sick or for one or other reason cannot actually be a member of the, of the panel. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm thinking, um, isn't then that the problem is with the, with the rules? Um, because if you have five members of the court and you look at the, the amount of work that has been done up until today mm -hmm. and that, relatively speaking, the court is not that busy. But of course we are talking that because of the elections, things might be, might be up. Is there any justification really for five members to sit, um, all of them at the same time? And, and I'm saying this based on, I'm looking at the, uh, I, I was able to, to read about 10 uh, judgments from, from that court sitting here today, because they are relatively short. It's about three pages, four pages, mm -hmm. seven pages. I think the, the longest that I've read is it's, it's eight pages. So I'm just thinking, five people sit, and most of those that I've read, they seem not to be based on the interpretation of any legislation. They state the law and they are resolved on the facts. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, sit, I'm just thinking five people, they sit together, they produce um, about seven pages of a judgment. Isn't there perhaps maybe the problem with the rules that perhaps maybe two people should be sitting or three people should be sitting? Wouldn't that be of assistance as opposed to trying to increase the number of the members? I mean, from a budgetary and a resource point of view. Well, remember, the, the act takes precedence over the rules. So that's the first thing that we have. If, if the act says you need to have five, the rules can't say you need to have three, because that will, be, that will create a problem, because that's, that's, that's not how legislation should function. It's, the, the, the rules must comply with the act, okay? That, that's the first point. Now, section 20, it says, well, section 19, it says there must be three members, three of whom must be judges, one of whom must be, one of whom must be a judge of, of the SEA, who is going to be a chairperson, okay? And then the two non-members, in other words, two out of five, the two non-members uh, are not uh, non-judges non members. Mm -hmm. Well, they are not judges. So the quorum of the court is three. It must be two judges at least with non-judge member. So that's, that will be a quorum. So if, if two people are sitting, that will not be a quorum. So it must be two plus at least, that's what the legislation says, at least there must be one non-judge member. So in other, words, uh, in other words, the quorum would be three, and then for that court to sit. But preferable, there must be five members sitting. Um, I, I, I understand that. Yes. Um, and, and I will make an example with the Constitutional Court, where mm. it said the court itself has to have 11 members. Yes. But the people who are sitting can be from the or yes, yes to constitute a quorum yes. I, I don't quarrel with that i'm just mm. lining it with your with your vision to say from an efficiency point of view notwithstanding what the act and the rules might be saying now like moving forward from your vision i'm just saying from an efficiency point of view does it really make sense for five people um to to to, to say it while perhaps maybe that's i was making an example that perhaps maybe two or three people uh, from an efficiency point of view, notwithstanding what currently the law is. I was just tapping okay, into see, your I vision. See, I yes. see, yeah it, might, yeah. it might give you a problem because now that's, that's what the legislation says and um, you will be doing something contrary to legislation if you were going to split up the panel and have two judges instead of two judge plus one non-judge member. The judge. Yes, Thank you very yeah. much, Deputy Chief Justice. Commissioner Ngoito. Um, thank you, TCJ. I, I hadn't actually intended to ask a question, but I think I've been called out. Oh, sorry, I thought let, you Let me ask a question, nevertheless. Uh, uh, I do have- You are there. like a person who joined the church today and asked, where are the pastors sitting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, so, but if the DCJ is giving me an instruction, then I'm not in that position, Commissioner Madam. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I suppose I've got just, just two points I, I would like to explore. The one is a, a, in relation to what you were discussing with uh, Commissioner Malem. Yes. The the Mshlope case you referred to uh, found that even though the IEC hadn't complied with Section 16.3, that's mm -hmm. the requirement for the confirmation of addresses, the court could suspend that obligation and allow the, I think it was August 2016 elections. Yeah, 16, yeah. 2016, yes, to carry on. <coughs> now, the legacy of that judgment has been debatable because some people have argued that the, the court has no power under Section 172 to suspend a statutory obligation. But then matters came to a head when the court had to deal, the constitutional court had to deal with suspending an election entirely, which was in COVID. Mm -hmm. What is your view on this tension between the power of the court to decide the matter upfront, that we can see the election won't be free and fair, but the preference of the constitutional court in, in, the, in the last judgment is, well, let's do that exercise afterwards and not before. You, you, now we are referring to the case that was referred by the IEC to postpone. Uh, yeah, the, after I, the IEC report. versus yeah, Electoral Commission versus Minister of, of Cogta. Of Cogta, yes, 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 yes. Um, you see, again, I understand where the court was coming from in, 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 in that case, because once, once a date for election has come, then you have to hold the, the election, unless, of course, Something which was pointed out by it was it that uh, uh, C. G. Uh, the Chief Justice in his dissenting judgment, if if unless something extraordinary occurs that will necessitate the postponement of the election and the election will, which which will render election not being fair, uh, free and fair, um, you you have to you have to hold the, the elections. Yes, I understand that's what was found in, in Electoral Commission versus Minister of Cocktail. Yes. But the tension I'm pointing towards is the tension from the judgment of Justice Mohuel in Mklob, mm, yeah. who says that you are not complying with Section 16.3 because you don't have residential addresses, but the court has the power to suspend the obligation to comply. Are you say, I mean, what is the way of resolving it jurisprudentially? One way which I can propose, maybe you can look at it, is to say the judgments are distinguishable because Mklope was about suspending a statutory obligation and that Electoral Commission versus Minister of Cocta was about suspending a constitutional obligation yeah. under Section 159. And to that extent, although you have some power to suspend a statute, but I think even that reasoning is very thin and that's why I'm trying to tease out as the, as the person who's going to be presiding over this court, what are your actual All jurisprudential right. views? Or well, sorry, sorry, I, I didn't understand your question um, clearly at, at first. Um, well, in Mshope, you are dealing with legislation non-compliance with legislation. And uh, that, non, well, that, that non-compliance was, was invalid, but... So it was what? Well, that, that non-compliance uh, with, with, well, let, let me just take it a step, uh, move a step further because I'm, I'm, I'm confusing myself now. You see, in Mshope, addresses had to be verified. When the elections were about, were about to be held, they hadn't been verified. The IC had not done what it had been mandated to do. 
in Mshope, it was easier for the Concord to suspend the non-compliance because it was dealing with legislation. Whereas in, the, in this case, IEC versus Minister of Culture, it was dealing with the Constitution. So it cannot, it was dealing with Section 159 of the Constitution. So, yeah, so sorry, before you, you continue, this is the last part. I mean, that is the distinction. Yes. But I want to know why does it matter from a jurisprudential point of view? Because it's still the language of parliament that you cannot have an election without addresses. I must be, I must be honest with you. It's, it's something that needs uh, the attention of the, of, 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 of the Concord. But from where I'm seated, um, it, 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 it's much easier for the, for the court to, to ignore the non-compliance in order to comply with the, well, to ignore the non-compliance with national legislation in order to comply <coughs> with the constitutional provision. That, that's how I see it. You know, we've got the national legislation versus the constitution. So, which, which is more important? Is it the national legislation or is the constitution? So I think that that approach of the jurisprudential, jurisprudentially, I would support that approach of the High Court because of the con of the con Court because it's, it was saying to itself, okay, we have got a situation here. There is an uncompliance with the legislation. Can we ignore it? To ignore it, it will mean that we'll be able to comply with the constitution. Whereas if we don't ignore it, then we won't be able to comply with the constitutional provision. So it, it was caught. Uh, in a sort of a hard place. So, but I think that it had to make a choice, and that choice had to depend on the paramountcy of the legislation that was before, and then it had to choose between the two legislation that uh, it was confronted with. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Commissioner Pillay? <coughs> Thank you, DCJ. Good afternoon, Judge Sandy. Good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Judge Sandy, the, the GCB raised in their comments uh, the fact that you have five years of active service left. Uh, I just want to get a sense from you, given kind of the periodic nature of the activity, the major activity of the court, mm. whether you think that should play a role in the decision making. Well, as well as it is now, uh, I'm busy with uh, the case that came to us uh, towards the end of um, uh, last month, and um, cases do come as and when. So that will—I uh, I don't think that the, the the period that is remaining for me uh, will have any impact uh, in 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 terms of my activities in in, in that court because. It's, 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 it's not that there, is no, there are no cases that um, come to that court. There are cases that come to that court, and then I'll, I'll be able to deal with those cases. So the fact that the, the, the period that is remaining for me is five years. You know, it's, um, and from a perspective of a disruption in the leadership of the court, should it be considered that we're dealing with this position now where there's no leader of the court and that to minimize disruption, you would want to consider a leader that will be there for a longer period of time as opposed to a, uh, just a, a five-year period? Well, I think that is entirely upon the, the, the members of this uh, commission to make the decision. And um, I'm saying that we, it's... I've got an experience, and my experience uh, will contribute to um, to enhance the jurisprudence of this court. And while I'm still around, I think that it will be fair for um, for me to be given an opportunity to use my experience in order to contribute to the jurisprudence of this court. Thank you, Judge Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? on the, sorry, from the virtual platform? 
I requested him. Just okay. look, look at the television screen in front of you. Oh, just okay. Yes, yes. Thank you, Judge Zondi, Commissioner Barnard. Um, I I'd like to speak to your or the SCA Matter Electoral Commission South Africa versus the Democratic Alliance. So um, it's the, the, the matter where there was, the, you know, the jurisdiction was discussed for various courts. And amongst others, in paragraph 47, it says, as stated in terms of the rules of the magistrate's court, High Court and the Electoral Court have jurisdiction to hear electoral disputes. So to a member of the public that uh, might be confused and, and need clarification, when do you do what? How would you explain the role of various forums or courts regarding the election disputes? In other words, which dispute does which court deal with? Do they all have concurrent jurisdiction? From where to where does one appeal, if at all, that sort of thing? Just a, 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 in, in very broad, short um, yeah. description of that thing. Thank you. Well, the disputes which fall within the ambit of the IEC are the disputes which relates to the mechanics of election. So anything, mechanics that is management, administration, so anything that relates to management, administration of the election will be a dispute which will fall within the ambit of the IEC. Now, the dispute which relates to adjudication, these are the disputes which would not fall within the, where, where in other words, where the IEC has to, one, like in, 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 in that case that we have just referred to the, the, I, the IEC versus the A, where a statement which uh, Minister Delil has had said it was um, defamatory. There, the, the IC had made a finding, and then, in addition to making a finding, imposed a remedial action. That is outside the, the mandate of, of, of the IC, because in, that dispute is a dispute that re did not relate to mechanism or to the management or to the administration of the election. It, it's something that fell. We outside the powers of the IEC. And therefore, all the IEC had to do there was to say, okay, we have made a finding, and then we take this dispute either to the magistrate court or to the electoral court to deal with it. In other words, uh, to make a, to adjudicate on that dispute. And so that at the end of the day, um, <coughs> a remedial, action could be taken against uh, the party. It didn't have, the IC did not have jurisdiction to deal with that dispute because it's a dispute that fell outside its mandate. It's, it was not about the mechanics of election. So that, that's how I would, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it might be difficult for, for, from the layman point of view, but that's, that's how the, it's, it's, it's the manner in which the act is it's, it's, it's framed. Shortly, yeah, but, but shortly, I'll, I'll just say where, where, where the IC has got to make an adjudication and, a, and, and to impose a remedial order, it would not have jurisdiction. That, that's how I would explain it in a layman's term. So as an aspirant leader of the court, do you think that uh, let's call it the dispute resolution organogram is effective if you were asked about reforming it, court framework around election disputes, what would your vision of for change to enhance efficiency? Um, some of the dispute that it dispute, I think that uh, there must be a rethink about the, well, characterization of the dispute and to say this type of dispute are a dispute that should be dealt with by the IEC because now a lot of disputes have been referred, I mean a lot of disputes now can be adjudicated by the electoral court. But if maybe we have got a situation where we would say, well, this is 
what the IC can do, and this is what the IC, the IC can find, and upon finding this, this is the sanction that it can impose, or this is a remedy that it can impose, that will assist. But as it is now, it's clear that any dispute that it's not related to the mechanics of the election, the IIC doesn't have a jurisdiction to deal with those disputes. Those disputes must be dealt with by, uh, the, must be referred uh, either to the magistrate court or to the electoral court. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, DCJ. Thank you. Thank you, DCJ. Good afternoon, uh, Justice Sondi. Good afternoon, uh, DCJ. Um, better. I have just one question for you. As you would know, the Supreme Court of Appeal carries a heavy workload. And if you are appointed as chairperson of the Electoral Court, you'll have an added responsibility. Do you think you'll be able to cope with the increased volume of work that would come about as a result of you taking on that additional responsibility? Well, I've got no doubt, uh, um, uh, acting president, that I'll be able to do so. And uh, obviously, if, uh, if the schedule of the Electoral Court uh, interferes with the schedule of, of the SCA. I would have to approach you, and in other words, what what is needed here is, is for us to work together, so that if if I've got a problem, I can communicate my situation to you and say, this court needs me. Can you release me, or can you give me some few days to attend um, to uh, matters of, of of the Electoral Court? So I think that. With the working together, I would be able to manage because I have to, my responsibilities to you as my leader. So I was appointed to serve the court in which you are a leader. So if there's something else that I need to do, I need to approach you if I get stuck to assist me uh, in, in um, providing me with, with time or getting me some, giving me some time off in order to deal with my secondary responsibility. Thank you, Judge Zoni. That's where we will leave it. Thank you. Thank you, DCJ. Thank you. I, I, I think Just President. one final question from me, Justice Zondi, and it's, it's an extremely unfair question to ask of you, but it has to be asked anyway. Um, our judiciary is in crisis in terms of um, gender diversity in the leadership ranks. There are no women heads of court. That, that is our reality. Uh, I understand that the one woman who heads a court, uh, Justice Mir, at the Land Claims Court, is it in an acting capacity? I, I, I think it's that I'm not... I'm not it, I, yeah, it's, it's acting, only yeah. in an acting capacity. Mm -hmm. So there is no woman heads of court in the heads of court cluster. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Justice Judge uh, J.P. Liu and I who, 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 who remained, and she just retired and um, deputizing. Uh, I'm also a deputy. So um, you're competing. This is, this is the question. You're, you, you, you are competing against a woman your colleague at the SCA, an accomplished woman, um, without understating your own stature, your, 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 you, you, you're a giant in, in, in your own right, but we have this, uh, this, this dilemma. What would you, if you're sitting where I am, what, what would you advise me to do when I had to choose now with, with this situation at hand? 
Yeah. Why should we appoint you over Justice Mochumi is the pertinent question. Well, well, well they, maybe you'll have to consider the experience and what I can add and um, um, whether where I want to take the court to by the time Judge Mochumi come in, a strong foundation would, would have been laid for her. You know? So yeah, that's, that's, that's my, my take, to say mm. you, you can take me and then with the vision that I've, I've got, I can implement my vision, and, uh, establish a solid foundation, and by the time, because I've got no doubt, she's a very committed uh, colleague, and by the time she comes in, there will be um, a good foundation and should be able to take the court to the next level. Thank you, Justice Sundi. Is there yeah. anything more you'd like to say to us before we excuse you? Okay, well, the, the other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, this court, I, I think that uh, electoral court uh, has gained a reputation both in Africa and in, internationally. And when there are disputes like it has happened in Kenya, Members of this court are, are invited to come and, and, and assist and, uh, in resolving those disputes. I think that it's, it's important that uh, we should make sure that we, in terms of, um, in, 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 in terms of outlook and the respect that this court has earned, that respect must be preserved. And, uh, both, both regional in Africa as well as international because it's, it's a well-respected court. Now and then we do get uh, invitation from international organization to share our experience with them. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Uh, you're excused. Thank you. Thank you very much, members of the commission, for giving me an opportunity to present uh, myself here. I really appreciate it. Thank you.